All right, everybody, we're going to get started here and I'll watch the chat. I'll watch the uh, waiting room. We'll get everybody in. Um, thanks for joining. Today is a call that I've been excited about for a long time. Um, uh, we our, our group has been focused on helping real estate agents become investor friendly uh, agents. And uh, as, as we've talked with different folks, they brought different energy to what we've been doing. Uh, today, we get to talk with somebody I'm a big, big fan of. I'm going to give my 90 second story about Tom uh, as an intro here. Um, so back in, I started in this business in 2004, and the owner of the company that I uh, hang my license said, hey, you have to go off to this GRI, GRI course, course over in Bend, Oregon. And I was like, I don't want to go to this course for four days. Like, but, you know, it is what it was, what it was, and it is what it is. And folks, you know, that education is still super important. Well, I went to Bend, Oregon, and two of the days were hosted by this guy by the name of, of Tom Lundstedt. And Tom spoke to us about uh, becoming what I didn't even know the term, but it was really investor friendly agents back in the day, learning about investment properties and how to analyze those properties. Um, Tom was a super funny guy, but he told this one story that I really latched on to um, regarding uh, an agent that sat through one of his classes. And this agent was somewhere in the Midwest and this agent was new to the business and all these things I related to. And he took everything that Tom taught him and went back and he watched his business grow like crazy, specifically because he attracted one customer who had all this investment property. And this guy knew how to talk about it differently than everybody else. I did the same sort of thing. I came back to Corvallis and found a niche for myself, working with investors, using Tom's tools and uh, using what Tom taught me. So um, so without further ado, we've got Tom Lundstedt with us today. Tom's uh, website is tomlundstedt.com. Uh, Tom has taught over 2,500 uh, live audiences across, uh, across the nation and beyond. Um, Tom is a, was a pro baseball player. He came out of pro baseball and realized that he had to uh, make a living for himself and he found investment real estate and uh, he created a, a space for himself and he's learned to teach people about what he does and how he does it. So I'm going to turn it over from Tom because that's what, why we're all here and let you run with it, Tom. All right, Lee, you know, the baseball, actually I, I played for the Chicago Cubs and Minnesota Twins and I, I was, I was not a good player. I mean, there's no bad players in the big leagues, but uh, we had on our, on our team, we had an old, old pitcher. He, uh, he was like 35 and he'd been in the big leagues a dozen years. And I would sit next to him in the bullpen where the pitchers, I was a catcher uh, go. And he would say during the games, he'd say, you know, Tom, you're not a very good player. You better figure something else out. Uh, and he had bought a rental house every year of his major league career. He owned about a dozen houses. And uh, I didn't even know you could do that, but that lit my fire. I learned it. And, uh, uh, when I retired from baseball, I got a real estate license. I got my real estate license. I'm just thinking of it now. 45 years ago, I, I got my real estate license the day Elvis died. So that's how I keep track how long I've been in the business. And every year they say, well, this is the such and such anniversary of Elvis. Uh, all right. So we, we don't have much time uh, today. And I want to uh, jump right in and show, talk about how to uh, analyze uh, a rental property. And so are you seeing my screen? Hang on one second. Not yet, Tom. All right. Lee mentioned I've done 2,500 live presentations. And not that I'm not live right now, but uh, <laughs> this is a whole different deal, you know, versus in person. Have any of you been with me in person? You know, I'm so I'm looking at the list and I know she's quiet, um, but back in the day when you made your way out to Corvallis, um, yeah. uh, one of the, oh, she was on the call. She might, anyways, there was someone who jumped on the call earlier. Her name was Trisha. I know she uh, sat through um, and I don't know if anybody else has. There you go. Angelica, uh, who's also in the Oregon area said she sat through. Uh, you were the best uh, of the whole GRI, GRI team out here in Oregon, so. Yeah, I missed GRI in Oregon. So let's just jump right in. We're going to talk about rental property today. And I'm sitting in Wisconsin. I'm 2,000 miles from you. I, here's what I don't want you to do. I do not want you to sit there. And, we're going to use an example. I want to walk you through a worksheet. Uh, and don't, don't sit there and say, oh, those numbers wouldn't be right in our town. Or that rent's not even close. It, it's OK. There's no way I can make the numbers right for, for you. But I want to show you how to do this. Once you know how to do this, 
and how to kind of talk the talk with investor clients, you can do this anywhere, big town, small town, big property, small property, everything in between. So you can apply it to a rental house. Do you agree a single family rental house is every bit as much investment real estate is the biggest shopping mall in all the land. Could you become a real big investor investing in a bunch of real small property? And the answer is yes. Now, think of a rental property as a money machine. It's a money machine. The reason people buy rental property is to make money. It's a money machine of, made up of three parts. What are the parts? Think about what are the parts? Income, expenses, financing. And if you don't mind, take a little note with me and we're gonna to go to a worksheet and I'll, sh I'll show you how to get that worksheet. Uh, and this is being recorded. So people will be watching this you know, days from now uh, and they'll think, well, how do I get this worksheet? I'll show you that just in a second. Income, expenses, and financing. Uh, whether it's a little rental house or a big shopping mall, it's got income, expenses, and financing. Those are the three parts of the machine. Which of those parts is important? All of them. They're all equally important. If you change the income, you've changed the money machine. If you change the expenses, you've changed the money machine if you change the financing. So you would not buy a property without knowing those three parts. You would not list a property without knowing those three parts. Do you agree with me? A lot of people in the real estate business who've been in the business a long time really aren't confident with how investment real estate works. Well, you wouldn't list a property without knowing those three. Now, once you know those three parts, then you can turn that money machine on, flip the on switch, and it'll grind away. And it'll produce four financial benefits. What are they? What are they? Four benefits. First benefit is income. It's called income property, folks. There ought to be some income there. And all investment real estate has income. It's just not always positive uh, income. I bet you know somebody owns a building with negative income. Uh, you might be, you might be uh, in the same household with somebody who owns a building with negative income. Now, what is this income actually called? We, we in real estate, we don't call it income. We don't call this stuff what everybody else calls it. After that, put CFBT. CFBT, what does CFBT stand for? Cash flow before tax. CFBT. And the market shortcuts a little bit and calls it cash flow. So benefit number one would be cash flow. Uh, what else? What else? What else? Uh, number four, appreciation. Put appreciation down there. Appreciation, the property might go up in value over the years, not overnight, but over the years. One of the nice things about real estate is it's a relatively stable investment, relatively stable. It typically doesn't spike up and spike down overnight. In the stock market, you could lose your money overnight, yes? Where in real estate, it takes you months. Uh, it's slow. Uh, and so uh, appreciation, we hope we get some. What, what else? What else? What else? Uh, look at number three, tax savings, income tax savings. Owning the property might save us some income tax. That would be great. What creates the tax savings? Depreciation. Depreciation, which is a non-cash expense. Non-cash. Tax deductions are good. Non-cash deductions are great because you get to deduct them. You just don't have to pay them. It's just accounting. And we'll talk about in another session what happens when you sell and recapture and all that. And then how about the second benefit? The second benefit's a little more subtle. It always gets shuffled off to the side, but it's a powerful benefit. What else? What's happening to the loan? The loan's being paid down. By whom? The tenants, I hope, I hope. Principal reduction, let's call it. Principal, P-A-L. Principal reduction. The loan's being paid down by the tenant. Somebody else is buying you that property. How many of you can think of somebody who's rented the same house for 20 years? Have they not paid for that house, for somebody else? All of us, even the people in the future now who are going to be watching this recording, uh, we, we all of us are going to buy two or three houses in our lifetime. It's just a question of for whom. Uh, and it's, it's sad when you when you see somebody who maybe who's, who's rented their whole time and actually paid for the house for somebody else. So think of this, three parts, income, expenses, financing, all very important. Once you know the three parts, then flip the on switch and it'll produce those four benefits, cash flow, principal reduction, income tax savings, and appreciation. Now, we should estimate these four benefits when? Before we buy the property. Now, you can't argue with that, but people don't do it. How many of you know people who bought a property and never even analyzed it? We need to analyze the property before we buy. We need to analyze it before we list the property. Do you know somebody in our business who's taken a listing on a rental property without having a clue what they're doing? And is investment real estate 
uh, different than residential, not better, not worse, just different. It's a different set of skills. And uh, could you become a real big investor investing in a bunch of small properties? Sure, sure. And uh, you can build a really nice real estate practice dealing with investors if you can talk the talk. Now, wouldn't it be cool if there was like a one page worksheet that allowed us to analyze these all on one page? Wouldn't that be something? It's like a miracle. Look at the worksheet. Here's a worksheet. This is one of six worksheets that I developed for real estate people. And this is a terrific worksheet to analyze a rental property before you buy the property, before you list the property. And if you look at this worksheet, at the, the top half up here, the whole top half, that's the three parts of the machine, income, expenses, and financing. This middle portion right here, middle portion, there's your four benefits, room number one, two, three, four, and more importantly, how to calculate them. If you just follow the worksheet, it'll lead you right through. And then uh, the bottom line are some various rates of return, which we'll talk about if we, uh, if we have time. Now, I'm going to do an example, and I'm going to show you how it works. And don't be afraid to ask a question. I'm glad to take any questions. But first, I want to say, here's something I think is important. We're, we are not the, uh, the accountant, the attorney. The purpose of this webinar is to familiarize you with several investment issues. Now, I'm not trying to turn you into an accountant or attorney. We're going to discuss important tax issues. It's important to make it clear right up front that the presenter, Tom Lundstedt, that's me, uh, is not engaged in rendering legal accounting or other professional services. And you, you, you know, you know how to do uh, 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 this and, and have. Uh, you, you just don't want to put yourself in a position where you're trying to advise somebody on their taxes. That's not our job. Everybody's situation is unique. So before you or your clients take any real word action, be sure to check with the proper professionals. But look at this last paragraph. Keep in mind, we're not the accountants, we're not the attorneys. Leave that stuff to the professionals, but knowing the material in this program should help talk the talk. Once the attorneys and the accountants in your town realize how knowledgeable you are, it's likely you'll get some good referrals because they have clients who want and need good investment property. Good accountant, good attorney, good real estate agent. That's a fabulous financial team. And I'm betting, Lee, that you you've had listings and sales referred from accountants and attorneys. Would that be a true statement? You know, Tom, I've got uh, two things to add here, which which are important. The answer is yes. When I came back from uh, uh, learning from you, I reached out to accountants and attorneys right away. And it's amazing the response that I got from them. And like we all know accountants, we all know attorneys, and they want to have good agents to send their clients to. So knowing this. They're looking for agents who understand this. <laughs> yeah. The other piece I want to add just before you jump into your worksheet. One of the things I love about this worksheet is it hasn't changed in the 18 years, 20 years I've been in this business. It continues. Try 45 years. <laughs> it hasn't changed since Elvis died. <laughs> Funny. All right. I'm going to let you keep going. It hasn't changed right. since Elvis died. That's the line of the day. All right, here we go. I want to I want to show you this and just relax. I'll do all the work. I know you don't have the worksheet in front of you, but those of you who want the worksheet and, and several other worksheets, if you go to my website, which is tomlunstead.com, don't do it now, but click on the baseball bat that I'm holding. I'm holding a baseball bat on the website, and that'll take you to a side page where there are several things, uh, including uh, clean copies of the worksheet. You have my permission to use these. They're copyrighted worksheets, but you have my permission uh, to use them. And what you're going to do here now in the next few minutes, this is a little bit of uh, a four part series that I have. If you like what we're doing and want to go deeper into investment real estate, check out the four part series on my website. I think you'll, I think you'll like it. All right. Uh, look at the top of the worksheet. Now we're going to talk about a real property. I've got a friend here in Wisconsin named Maggie and who, who inherited money from her grandma. And Maggie called me not too long ago. And she said, Hey, Tom, I'm thinking about buying this rental property. Would it be a good deal? Well, I'm not going to tell you what I think, but I'm going to show you the numbers on it. And then I'm going to ask you what, what you think. All right. Well, this is, let, and so at the top, $409,000. 409000 is the cost. Is that a good deal? Is there enough information up there to tell that's a good deal? No. If you can tell if that's a good deal just from that, I'll go to your webinar. Uh, no, what would you want to know? location you want to know yeah you got to be able to find it what what what, what else? Uh, the how about the terms the terms does it matter it's if it's 409,000 cash or 409,000 a dollar a year for 409,000 years 
That would be two extremes. Well, this one is available, 62,000 cash invested. So put 62,000 there, 62,000. And uh, now she's got to borrow. Here's Maggie. She's got to borrow the remaining $347,000. Now, let me ask you a question. Does the interest rate on that financing affect the value of that property? Yeah, sure does, doesn't it? The greater the interest rate, the more money that Maggie would have to pay uh, to, to finance the thing, the less money she'd have for herself. So the financing is absolutely uh, critical. Well, this financing happens to be all owner financing. This is a real property. The owner's an old man. He's 50 and he's owned this property a long time and he absolutely refuses to cash out. He's offering this to Maggie. He's offering this, he wants a high interest rate. He, and he'll he'll string it out till it's paid with no balloon payment. But in return for that interest rate risk that he wants, he would be taking, he wants a high interest rate. He's offering this 347 at 7% interest. 7%, hang on, I'm, I'm hung up. Um, I couldn't find a lot. There we go, 7%. Now you could do way better than this going to the bank. You can't go to the bank on this one. This is the only way he's going to sell. All right. The payments on this would be $2,450 a month. And that times 12 is $29,400 in debt service. We call that debt service. Just fancy words for principal and interest. Now, here's Maggie. She's got the $62,000. She knows she wants to invest it in real estate, but she's not sure she wants to buy this property or the one across the street or the one back around the corner. And you explain to her when she asks you, hey, do you think this is good for me? You say, well, Maggie, it's a three-part money machine, and we only know one part. Remember, income, expenses, and financing. Okay, we know the financing. Now, what do we want to know? The income. The income. What if I was the seller? Assume I'm the seller and assume you're Maggie. What, what would you want to know? You'd say, hey, Tom, what's your income? Well, what does that mean, what's my income? Does it mean gross? Does it mean net? I don't know. I don't, you can't just say to somebody, what's your income? Nobody knows what that means. What's your income? We're going to see here on a rental property, there are four different types of income. And if Maggie says, hey, Tom, what's your income? Could I think she means what's my income? When she really means what's my income, when the most important thing of all is what's my income? So we got to be more specific. The first type of income, skip down a few lines, is called the annual rent. See that right there? The annual rent. The annual rent is the total amount of income that Maggie would collect if every unit in the building was rented every day of the year. This is a little apartment building. It's a little apartment building. And it doesn't matter where it is. And here's where, don't key in on the numbers, key in on the concept. And you can apply the same concept, the same work to any property. You can do it in, in, in Oregon, you can do it in California, you can do it in Florida. 67,900, that's the total possible income. That's assuming everything is rented every day of the year at full price. Now, what are the odds that's gonna happen? Not very good, not very good. Uh, I know this is unbelievable, folks, but, but sometimes there's no tenants, and we need to make an adjustment for that. This is even more unbelievable. Sometimes, even if there's tenants, there's no rent. Just because you got tenants doesn't mean you got rent. So we need to make an adjustment for vacancy and credit losses. And so you'd have to study your market a little bit. In this case, let's use 10%. If Maggie gets any of that 10%, that's a bonus. Now, I'm not saying you should always use 10%. You should use whatever whatever's appropriate. Are you in Corvallis? Is, uh, is the market such right now? If I moved there and said, I want to rent a house for a year, would it be easy or hard to find a rental house? Hard. Hard? Yeah, hard. That's true in almost ever, everywhere. 10%, uh, let's take that away. And she's left with $61,110. And we call that $61,110 her gross operating income, G-O-I, gross operating income. Now, if you're not used to using these words, don't worry, we'll use these words over and over. You'll get real comfortable with these words. What does gross operating income mean? Put in words a baseball player can understand. I don't understand gross operating income. I couldn't even figure my own batting average. My batting average, I could figure in my head, uh, but not those guys who could hit. You know what my lifetime major league batting average was? Yeah, 200. Lifetime major league batting average, 311, if you add it up, which is how I figured. I hit 103 years in a row. How else would you do it? Now, so 61,110, this is what she actually collects. She actually takes into her checkbook 61,110. Now, if that's true, should Maggie immediately go book a $61,110 cruise around the world based on her profit from this little business? Might that be a little premature, eh? Because now she's got to what? She's got to run the business. She's got to pay her operating expenses. And you see the next lines here? 
All these next lines, these are operating expenses. The operating expenses are everything besides your debt service. Your mortgage payments aren't operating expenses. Things like utilities, insurance, repairs and maintenance, management, property tax, all those things are operating expenses. Uh, now, we're not going to go line by line, but you got a line there. But here, let me just give you the total. The total is 27747 This is a real property, remember? This is a real property. 27747 all right, so now, remember, it's a three-part money machine, income, expenses, financing. We know all three parts. Now, how important is it to have accurate income and expenses here? Real important. It couldn't be important to her. Uh, how would you verify this? How would you, what if I said, oh, just trust me. These are the numbers on my property. Trust me. Are you going to trust me? No. How would you check those out? You could see the books, but are there some sellers who don't keep very good books? I don't mean they're crooks. I just mean they don't pay, uh, keep very good books. Are there some sellers that keep really good books? Are there some sellers that keep such good books? They keep several different sets. Uh, books, I got books. No, no, uh, you don't want the seller's book. If the seller's a rounder, where's the seller gonna round these numbers? To whom is the seller rounding the income down and the expenses up to the IRS? To the IRS. Much of this property is sold contingent on seeing the seller's Schedule E. Schedule E is nothing fancy, but I'd write that down. Any of us who own rental property file a Schedule E every year for every property we own. And it's on that Schedule E where we report the income and the expenses of our rental property. Should I be offended if Maggie, the buyer, asks to see my, the seller's Schedule E? No. Is she asking to see the income from my job? No. My personal deductions? No. Just the income and the expenses on that property. And should the numbers on my Schedule E be darn close to these numbers? Yeah. And if they're not, should there be any explanation? Maybe there was some unusual expense last year or something. What if I said, hey, Maggie, I'm not, I'm not showing you that Schedule E. I'll tell you that right now. I'm not, I'm not showing you that. Uh, well, that would make you really nervous. There's no reason an honest seller wouldn't show you their Schedule their Schedule E, all right? So I, you know what? I got a phone call not too long ago from a lady in Springfield, Illinois. Springfield is the capital of Illinois. And she's a, she's a customer. On my website, there's this four-part series that I would encourage you to buy. Well, I do free coaching, anybody who buys that. So she was a customer of that. And she called me and she said, hey, Tom, I want to tell you, I want to tell you a story. I said, okay, what? She was attempting to buy, I think it was a 10-unit apartment building in Springfield, Illinois. And the, the seller was marketing the property and the, the listing agent was marketing the property with a gross operating income here of $93,000, 93,000 and some change. And uh, uh, Maggie made an offer, not Maggie, but the woman in Springfield, she said, I made an offer, but I made it contingent on seeing the seller's Schedule E, because that's typically how it's done. No, you're not going to call up the seller and say, send me your Schedule E, they'll tell you to go jump in the lake. Typically, the listing broker puts the number, gets the Schedule E from the, from the seller, and you as a lister want to for sure have that Schedule E before you list the property. And then the lister listing agent puts the numbers out to the marketplace and the buyer makes an offer based on those numbers, but the offer is contingent on seeing the seller's Schedule E within X days and the buyer has X days in her absolute discretion to avoid the transaction. So the lady in Springfield made the offer based on 93,000 and she put in the purchase agreement, it's contingent on seeing the seller's Schedule E. And uh, one morning she said she presented the offer to the listing agent and the listing agent went ballistic the listing agent says what is this schedule e thing we don't we don't do that here and she said well i got to know the numbers are right I, you know i well he said we don't do that and i said to her well so what'd you do she said well i folded up my briefcase i went home i got well that afternoon the listing broker called her back and said you know i've been doing some checking and i guess it's reasonable that you'd want to verify the numbers so they revived the offer they negotiated they got an accepted offer contingent on seeing the seller Schedule E. And uh, she got the seller Schedule E within three days. Take a guess what the actual income on the property was. He Remember the seller, he was marketing, the agent was marketing the property with 61,000, uh, I mean, with uh, 93,000, 93,000 something. She got the Schedule E, $38,000. Now you tell me, would that skew the numbers a little bit? If you bought a money machine expecting it to produce 93,000, it produces 38,000. Well, that's not going to work. 
And so uh, she didn't buy the property. Now, so Schedule E, and then there's also a little measurement that we use called an operating expense ratio. The operating expense ratio uh, on the property is uh, nothing more than the operating expenses divided by the uh, gross up. Hey, I'm, I'm hung up here. Hang on. Let me stop the sharing. I'll, I'll come. I'll be right back. Sounds good. Thanks, Tom. So, folks, what uh, Tom's going through here uh, while uh, while he's getting that back up and going, um, if you can get your hands on the worksheet, um, using that and even you know working with your clients to use that, um, you can quickly analyze just about any property. It tells you the questions you should be asking, the information you should be looking for. Um, it is just a really good tool to have, you know, in your in your toolbox um, to, to really look at properties, because one of the things that most buyers look at and even agents look at is just the one line item that Tom got us to here, the gross operating income. And keep in mind, there are so many more aspects of, of real estate that create value. And that's one of the reasons so many buyers miss out on deals is because they don't see all the value, which is what Tom's going to get into next. Back to you, John. Yeah, you're right, Lee. The, the, the 61110 in this case, the gross operating income, a lot of people stop right there. And have you heard people say they buy a property uh, based on how many times the gross income it is? You hear, you hear people say, well, I pay seven times gross or eight times gross. Or, or, or you've heard this, I'll bet. Uh, the 1% rule, you heard the 1% rule? The 1% rule says, that a rental property ought to rent for 1% of its value a month. So if you've got a property that rents for $1,000 a month, well, that property, they say, is worth $100,000. If it rented for $2,000 a month, it's worth $200,000. That's a bunch of baloney. Uh, that's the gross multiplier. The gross multiplier. Don't fall into the trap. Uh, that's not a good way to buy property. That's how the amateurs buy property. Uh, don't, don't do it. Um, and so you, you want to know all three parts. You want to know all four benefits. So we know the three parts up at the top. And now where I was hung up, you see it says operating expense ratio is the operating expenses divided by the gross operating income. It's just your operating. So in this case, it would be 27,747 divided by the 61,110. And that equals about 45%. So what that's saying is of every dollar that Maggie would collect, 45%, 45 cents goes to just run the business, just to run the business. That means she's got 55 cents left over to do what with? To pay her mortgage and pay herself. She's got to get her debt and herself paid, not out of a dollar, but out of, in this case, 55 cents. Therefore, is this operating expense ratio a real important number to know? Yes. And there will be an average operating expense in your town on certain types of property. And that'll be different on a shopping center that is in an office building and it is on a, on a rental house. But that'll be a number you'll know with some experience in your marketplace. So let's assume these numbers are correct, the three parts. Now, what are the four benefits? We'll look at the next section of the worksheet, Roman numeral one, two, three, four. Roman numeral one is how we figure the cash flow. Cash flow. And let's just, it tells you exactly, it's like a roadmap. So it's the first line, it says gross operating income, 61,110. I'm just bringing that number down to Roman number one. Then it tells you what to do, minus the operating expenses, 27,747, that equals 33,363. $33,363, and we call that 33,363 her net operating income, NOI. Have you heard that term before? I bet you've heard the term, the NOI. The net operating income, is the most important number up there. I'm going to put a little star by that number. Net operating income uh, is uh, the center of the universe and everything else is just kind of planets revolving around it. The net operating income is the amount of money Maggie would have in her pocket at the end of the year she bought the property, how? Cash, cash. If Maggie came along and said $409,000, no problem. 
And she wrote a check for $409,000. Well, at the end of the year, she'd have 33,363. Uh, but she's not doing that. Maggie's coming along saying 409,000. Okay, okay. But I'll give you 62,000 cash and finance this other 347. So the next thing she has to pay out of that net operating income is her debt service. And her debt service in this case, look at the top, is $29,400. That's $24.50 a month payment times 12. $29,400. So here's Maggie. She's got the 33,363 net operating income. She's got to pay the mortgage, $29,400. She's left with $3,963. $3,963. And we call that $3,963 her cash flow before tax. Is that good? What do you think? $39.63 cash flow. Good? Well, it's better than $38.63. Uh, it's not as good as $4,000. It's better than negative. Better than negative. How many of you know people own a building like this where that number is a negative number? How many of you know people own a building like this and they want that number to be a negative number? No, you don't. No, you don't. Nobody, know, well, nobody wants that number to be a negative number. If that number was negative, what would it mean to Maggie? She'd be losing money. Whose money? Her money. What kind of money? Real money. Nobody wants to lose their own real money. If you want to lose your own real money, there's a lot easier ways than this. Uh, what people want is to make money, but tell the IRS they're losing money. Uh, is that possible? Is it possible to make money, yet tell the IRS you're losing money? Is that legal? Yes, that's legal. What a country. Uh, in this case, 3963 cash flow. Now, can she spend that cash flow? 3963. Yes, on what? Anything she wants. It's her money. Instead of a $61,110 uh, cruise around the world, could she end up with a $3,963 uh, weekend in Newark? Uh, yeah, or someplace. I'm not knocking Newark. If somebody's in Newark, I love Newark. Uh, but anyway, 39.63. It's her money. now. Let me let me say something really important here, and this is something I think you should bring up with your with your clients. All dollars are not created equal. They all look the same, but they're not the same. They're all treated differently by the IRS. And these numbers, these 39.63 cash flow numbers, are treated totally different than other numbers, other dollars we might earn. What if you showed this to Maggie and Maggie said, you know, if you want me to invest $62,000, worry about this thing all year and I end up with $3,963 in cash flow, I could put the 62,000 in the bank and probably do that well. And you'd say, Maggie, this is just the first benefit. She says, I don't even wanna hear the rest, you know, if you're starting with your good stuff. And you say, Maggie, I wanna, I wanna explain something to you. Maggie says, I could go, I could work at my job overtime and make $39.63. Uh, same difference without worrying about anything. And that's not true. If I made $39.63 at my job, what would I have to pay? Federal tax, state tax, depending on your state, self-employment or social security tax. Those dollars from your job are cut in half. Those of you who sell real estate, if you're successful at it, you're in probably approaching a 50% marginal tax bracket, state, federal, and self-employment tax. Those dollars you earn are really 50 cents. Now, what if that 39.63 came from cash flow? Oh, those dollars are taxed completely differently. We're gonna see that the dollars from cash flow can be sheltered from income tax, state and federal, and they're exempt from social security self-employment tax. You don't pay social security or self-employment tax on the 39.63. The, the dollars of cash flow, this is the important part. The dollars of cash flow are twice as good as a dollar from your job. You'd have to earn, Maggie would have to earn twice this, almost $8,000 at her job to equal $3,963. And people say, ah, what a pain in the butt it is to own real estate. Well, it would have to be twice the pain in the butt having a job is because the dollars are twice as good. Really important concept. First benefit, 39.63, but we got to keep going. We got to keep going. Second benefit, principal reduction. Principal reduction. What does that mean? Well, let's start. We take the annual debt service, which is 29,400, right? We're just bringing that from the top, 29,400. Then and minus the interest, minus the interest. Uh, we need to know how much interest we pay. 
And how would you do that? If you take the time to amortize this loan, and amortize, remember, is a three-syllable uh, word. It's, it's the most mispronounced word in the real estate business. What's the, what's the first? It's the second most mispronounced, not the most. It's the second most mispronounced. The first leads by a mile. What is it? Realtor. The word is not realtor. It's realtor. Now, we all know that, but how many of you know somebody who actually claims to be one? who pronounces it realtor or the double whammy. They say I'm a realtor with X, Y, Z, reality. That's by far. Next time you're somebody in our business, say they're a realtor, you look them right in the eye and tell them they ought to have their head examined by a doctor. Now, so amortize is the second most mispronounced. It's not a motorized or amortize. It's amortize, muerte, muerte. Anybody speak Spanish here? Root word, muerte. What's it mean? Death to kill. We're killing off the loan. If you take the time to amortize the loan, you'll find 24,123 of that is interest. What that means is the difference, 5277 is principal. All that means is after one year, Maggie doesn't owe 347,000 anymore. She owes 347,000 minus the 5277. She owes 342,000 roughly. And you think, ah, what's the big deal? Well, it is a big deal. Who paid that for her? The tenants. The tenants paid her loan down 5277. She doesn't get the money to when? She sells or maybe refinances, right? It's not a current benefit, but absolutely it's a benefit. If you don't think it's a benefit, take it to the extreme. What if that was a $347,000 30-year loan and Maggie kept that property for 30 years? What would she have at the end of 30 years besides an old building and really old tenants? An old paid-for building that who paid for for? Those old tenants, those old tenants are saying, Maggie, we'd like to buy you this building. Are we gonna say no? And yet most people do say what? No, oh no, uh, uh, they might call me up. Well, call you up? They ought to be able to call you up once in a while. They're buying you a building for heaven's sakes. Uh, so that's the second benefit. First benefit is cash flow, 3963. Second benefit is 5277. She doesn't get the 5277 though until she what? Sells or maybe refinances, right? It's not a current benefit, but it's, a, it's absolutely a benefit. Now, what does she tell the IRS? Third benefit. The honest truth is the IRS doesn't care a whole lot about what we've done here so far. What the IRS cares about is Roman numeral three. Roman numeral three, right, right here, this is how you figure the taxable income on any business in America, a little rental house, a big shopping center, a restaurant, your own real estate practice. It's the net operating income minus the interest minus the depreciation. That equals your taxable income. You know what that really is? Roman numeral three is really schedule E with all the fat boiled up. Schedule E is I think 31 lines long, I don't, I don't know. Uh, but here it is just whoop, trash compacted down to four lines. Net operating income minus the interest minus the depreciation. Okay, that doesn't look so bad. Let's help her out. Here's our friend Maggie. What's her net operating income? That's one with a star by it. That's 33,363. All right. Then the next thing she had to pay out of that net operating income was her debt service. But is her entire debt service deductible for tax purposes? No, 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 no. Only the interest. How much interest did she pay? Look in Roman numeral two, 24,123. So let's bring that down there. Notice you can only deduct the interest. You cannot deduct the principal. You have to leave the principal in there. And that has the effect of making it taxable. So net operating income minus the interest minus this third thing, this depreciation. And this is the part that goofs people up. And it shouldn't, we can make it real simple. Uh, the IRS wants Maggie or any of us to buy this property. She's gonna provide housing for these wonderful people. She's gonna, she's gonna invest her money. The seller's gonna pay tax on the money. Whatever's left over, the seller's gonna go out and buy stuff and all those people pay tax on the money. So she creates a lot of tax by buying the property. They want her to buy the property. As incentive for her to buy the property, Congress says, Maggie, if you buy this property, we will let you write it off as if it's going to zero value over time. We recognize it might be going up in value, really, but we'll let you write it off as if it's going to zero value over time. And that process is called what? Depreciation. Depre technically, absolute technically, it's not called depreciation anymore. Uh, what is, what is, it's two words. Two words. What's, it, what's the synonym for depreciation? C-R. Cost recovery. 
Yeah, I knew you'd get it. Cost recovery. Cost recovery, depreciation, same thing. If somebody, one of your clients says, gee, what would my cost recovery be? You go, man, I don't know. We didn't talk about that. No, no, cost recovery, depreciation, same thing. Well, she gets to deduct her depreciation. And in order to deduct her depreciation, she has to calculate how much depreciation she's entitled to. And so we need to talk about how much depreciation is she entitled to? In order to do that, we need to know what is she actually buying for $409,000? What tangible physical assets would she be buying? What is she buying? She's buying what? Land. Yeah, 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 yeah. A building. Yeah, yeah. Don't leave me now. Uh, personal property. And then one more. Land improvements. You're buying four things when you buy a rental property. And you want to divide your cost into those four categories. And most people, I would say a huge majority of people, only divide into land and building. That's really bad. That's legal, but you're throwing away money. You're just throwing money away if all you do is divide into land and building. Some people do land, building, and personal property. That's better, but it's not good. You want to do all four of these, land, building, personal property, and land improvements. And if you're not doing this, if you own rental property, you ask whoever's, whoever's uh, preparing your taxes, have you, have you divided into four? And if they're only doing land and building, you maybe have a little discussion uh, with them. So she needs, Maggie needs to know how much of that 409,000 is land, how much is personal, how much is building, how much is land improvements. How would you do that? How would you do it? How would you know how much is land? You could call the assessor, but the, the problem is the assessor doesn't know what the land is worth. The lesser, how, how many of you ever seen a property sell for a price different than the assessed value? Uh, you know what? In your town, when you're when you're listing a property, you don't you don't waste your time doing one of those CMA deals, do you? Where you compare this property to others like it that have sold recently with a garage and a fireplace. What a waste of time that is! Don't you just call the assessor and you think, well, that's stupid. Well, I agree, it's stupid. Well, it's just as stupid here. And so, how do we do it? How would you know how much is land? There's a word coming to you. Be open to it and let it come to you. And I could read your mind. Here's what you're all thinking. I know. Bifurcate. Bifurcate. That's what you're all thinking. Now, you're probably sitting there wondering, how in the heck did he know that? What does bifurcate mean? It's not a bad word. You say mix, mixed company, bifurcate, bifurcate. What does it mean? It just means divide. Look it up. It just means divide. Uh, we're actually dividing into four. We are by, 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 by for gain. Uh, if Maggie got good tax advice, her good advisor would say, Maggie, you need to bifurcate. Now, where's the best place to bifurcate on the purchase contract? The best place, on investor to investor. I'm not talking about the house you live in, not the house you live in. That's just going to mess up the whole deal. But investor to investor, a, a good buyer investor will put it right in the agreement. They'll put a, a paragraph in there that says of the, of the purchase cost, Here's how much is land. Here's how much is building. Here's how much, here, here, here's how much is land improvements. Does the seller care how much is land, building, personal property, and land improvements? Yes. The seller cares even more than the buyer. The reason the seller cares is each of these four categories is taxed differently. When you sell your property, you pay tax on your gains. Not gain, gains. You have a gain on the land. You have a gain on the person. You have a gain on the building. You have a gain on the land improvements. And they're taxed differently. So I, the seller, want to get as much of my cost on the thing that's taxed the least. The buyer, Maggie, wants to get as much of her cost on the thing that's depreciated the fastest. See, these are all depreciated uh, at, at different, over different years. And so we have this argument. Uh, and it's an, it's another negotiation. And it's very important. And it, it's very important. If you get the four part series on my website, we'll talk about this in detail when we talk about uh, selling. Uh, so uh, we, regardless, however you do it, you could do comps if you were Maggie, if there were comps, how much is the land, how much, but it, it, the absolute best would be probably have it in the agreement. So uh, now if, if it's going to mess up the deal, though, you can leave the agreement silent. You know, you don't want to be so smart, you never make a deal. But somehow, some way, you've got to establish land, building, personal property, land improvements. And the reason is each of these is depreciated over a different number of years. The land, zero. You can't depreciate the land. The IRS says, Maggie, you can't depreciate the land. She says, OK, then we go to personal property. Personal property would be things like stove, refrigerator, washer, dryer, drapes, cur curtains, carpeting, mailbox, garbage cans. That's all personal property. How many years? Five. Five years. What if it's a really old refrigerator? Five years. What if it's a brand new frigidaire right out of the box? Five years. What if I've already owned this property for years and years and years? I've depreciated all this junk down to nothing. Could Maggie buy it from me and start all over again? And the answer is yes. 
And you think, come on, how many times can the fridge wear out? Don't even think of it as wearing out. Think of it as what? What's the other word? Cost recovery. Cost recovery. Every buyer gets to recover her cost. Five years. The building, there's two possibilities, not two choices. If it's a residential rental building, that's 27 and a half years. So a residential rental building would be a rental house, a duplex apartment. The biggest apartment building in all, all the land would be a residential rental building. Then non-residential, 39 years, 39 years. In this case, for Maggie, it's a little apartment building, 27 and a half years. And then I'm going to put a little star by land improvements. The land improvements. If you're not depreciating your land improvements, you're making a big mistake. Land improvements are improvements to the land that don't really service the building. Uh, things aren't, if you own a rental property, aren't there lots of improvements to the property that aren't building? All the landscaping, the driveway, the sidewalk, parking lot, fence, underground sprinkling system, swimming pool, tennis court, playground, golf course, all those things. Those are land improvements. Land improvements are depreciable by themselves over 15 years. And people make a mistake by not depreciating their land improvements. In the four-part series, I'll show you, if you've only been doing land and building, how to fix that uh, and, uh, and start doing land building, personal property, and land improvements. Now, let's go back and finish up the worksheet. I know I, I'm, I'm limited to time here, so I'm conscious of that. Up here at the top of the worksheet, this is where you actually calculate the depreciation. See what it says? What's the land value, the personal property, the building, the land improvements? You cannot complete the worksheet without dealing with personal property and land improvements. You'd have a big hole in your worksheet if you didn't depreciate personal property and land improvements. Now, it gives you a line for what's the value and then times a percentage. We don't have time in this little session to do the whole percentage. But if you want the percentages, again, at my website, click on the baseball bat, and that'll take you to the depreciation chart where those percentages are. But in this case, let's say the total depreciation, first year depreciation for Maggie is $18,500. $18,500, that's from the, the, the personal property, the building, and the land improvements. So what? Big whoop. Where does it go? Well, we're down in Roman numeral three. Remember, Roman numeral three, net operating income minus the interest minus the depreciation. We now know the depreciation is $18,500. So put that down there. And now if you make this calculation, net operating income minus the interest minus the depreciation, you end up with a taxable income negative. The taxable income is a negative 9260. Those brackets be negative. A negative 9260. Everybody see that? Everybody agree with that? What if you showed this to Maggie? You say, Maggie, Maggie, look at this. Your tax income is negative 9260. What's she going to say? If she's like most people in the marketplace. When you say, hey, your tax income is negative 9260. Most people say what to that? Most people say, that's it, pal. If you mean I lose another 9,000 bucks on this turkey, I'm out of here. And you would say to her, what? How much money is she losing? Nothing. Nothing. She really has what? She really has 39.63 in her pocket. She's got 52.77 that the tenants paid down. She's ahead over $9,000, really. But when the IRS says, hey, Maggie, how'd you do on this property? What does she say? Oh, man, are you kidding? I lost $9,260. Well, the IRS says, well, Maggie, if you lost $9,260, you can now take that loss outside the building and use it over here against your other income from your job and so forth. Now, this is subject to something called the passive loss rules. The passive loss rules govern when, not if, when you get to use that tax loss, that negative 9260. Most people will be able to use it right now this year. But some people, if their income is too high, too, I say in quotes, uh, have to push that forward. They put it in a little drawer and it becomes a suspended loss and they carry it forward. But everybody's going to be able to use it. And you as a realtor, if you're a realtor or a, a real estate professional, I shouldn't say realtor, a real estate professional, uh, you, you can be exempt from the passive loss limits. And again, on my baseball bat, uh, at my website, click on there and there's a video about the passive loss rules. You want to be sure to ask your accountant about the passive loss rules. In this case, let's assume Maggie can use that loss this year. That, that negative 9,260 from the building will shelter 9,260 of her income from her job. And she doesn't have to pay tax on 9,260. So she's going to save tax. Circle taxes save. 
If that number was a positive 9260, she'd have to pay tax. But in this case, it's a negative 9260. And let's say and she's going to save state tax too, depending on her state. Could she easily be in a 30% tax bracket, state and federal? Most of you are in a 30, 35% tax bracket, state and federal. 30% of that would be $2,778 income tax saved. 27, seven, is that cash money? Yeah, that's cash, isn't it? If she does not buy this property, if she doesn't buy the property, what happens at 2778? She's got to pay it to the IRS. They want it in what? Cash. Uh, so that's 2778 cash. That's the third benefit. The fourth benefit, look at Roman numeral four, is appreciation. Appreciation. The property might go up in value. Now, I've got a number in mind. Let's use a percentage. I've got a number in mind for appreciation. What do you think we ought to use? I think we ought to use nothing. And it's my webinar, so guess what? Uh, put nothing, nothing. I think the property, the money machine ought to make sense with no appreciation. I'm not saying I want no appreciation. I'm saying the money machine ought to make sense as if there was no appreciation. The appreciation ought to be frosting on the cake. And I hope the frosting is thick, 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 but the cake ought to taste good by itself, you see? And I know that you know people who bought a rental property without doing any of this analysis. How many of you know people who bought a rental property that had negative cash flow, uh, it, where none of the first three numbers make any sense, but they're buying it because it's going to go up in value? Well, I hope it does, but that's not investing in real estate. That's speculating in real estate. And fine, there's nothing wrong with that, but recognize the difference between investing and speculating. An investor is buying a money machine and the money machine ought to make, make sense starting day one. A speculator doesn't do any of this. They just buy it and hope it goes up in value. I think that's dumb. Don't get mad at me, but it's dumb. If, if you're buying rental property, if I, if I was buying rental property that made no sense, uh, had negative cash flow, but I'm buying it because it's going to go up in value. I'm counting on in the future being able to find somebody even dumber than me. This is hard to do. I, I would hate for my portfolio to be based on finding somebody dumber than me. All right, so zero. And I'm kidding with you a little bit, but it ought to, don't you agree? It ought to make sense with no appreciation. I hope there's lots of appreciation. Down at the bottom, here's uh, some various rates of return. And the first one is return on investment with appreciation. We're not going to use that. Second one is return on investment without any appreciation. And it asks us to add up the three benefits. Uh, we add up the cash flow, 3963, plus the principal, 5277, plus the tax saved, 2778. If you add that up, that's $12,018. What would she, Maggie, be investing to get $12,018? In this case, $62,000. If you invest $62,000, you get $12,018. That's about 19% in your money. That's 19% in your money before what? Before any appreciation. Is that good? Is that bad? I don't know good or bad. I'm not even saying good or bad. Good or bad compared to what? You know, you'd have to study other properties in your town to know if that's good. And you think, well, it's good compared to money in the bank. Well, yeah, but you can't compare real estate to money in the bank. You got to compare real estate to other real estate. And so you'd have to do this worksheet on several properties in your town, and pretty soon you'll know what's a good deal, what's a bad deal in your particular town. If you know just this very basic, what we've done here just in, in, in less than an hour, you, you, you're, you got a lot, of, a lot of power there. Now, there's plenty more to learn. Uh, but this, this worksheet, you would do this worksheet before you buy. You would do this worksheet when else? You would do this worksheet every year on the anniversary date of your purchase and recalculate the rate of return on your, not on your investment, on your equity. Lee, that's what you were talking about when you introduced me. The, the, it was a fellow named Matt and Matt was from St. Louis. And he, uh, he, 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 he actually listened to what I said. And uh, he went out and used it. And I used to get calls from Matt. He, he, I, he cracks me up. He, I mean, really good young guy. Uh, and uh, now he doesn't even call me back when I call him. But he, he's big time. Uh, but he took this return on equity thing and he turned it into a whole, whole big deal. And so every year you'd figure how much equity you have in your property and redo the worksheet 
as if you're keeping the property and then your investment is your current equity. And see, as your equity grows and grows and grows, your rate of return falls and falls and falls. The rate of return on that equity. Some people uh, uh, own their property, rental property free and clear, and that's fine, but they got to realize they're probably only earning four or 5% on their equity and it's time to move that equity and reboot and, uh, and earn your whatever the percent is. And the best way to move that equity is with a 1031 exchange. And that's another thing we talk about in the four part series. Lee, that's what you're, you're talking about, right? Uh, yeah. So that's, that's real world stuff. And I know I'm running out of time. So uh, the worksheet, I think will help you a lot. Uh, if I can help, you know, don't, don't be afraid to, to contact me. Let me put, uh, Lee, you start talking. I'm gonna put my number up there just to. Yeah, you got it. So folks are hanging out here just a couple more minutes. Um, here's, here's where to contact me. And uh, it, that real estate investing made simple, profitable, and fun is a four-part webinar. This is just a little mini part of it. And I do free coaching. Anybody buys that. And so if you're interested, get it. Uh, I hope you learned something. I hope you had some fun. And I'll stick around if anybody has, has questions. Go ahead, Lee. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, Tom, why don't you go ahead and stop sharing here? I know there's at least one question going to pop mm -hmm. in here. Um, All right. Folks, one of the things that uh, Tom was showing us today is, and it's really important as real estate agents that, that you kind of pick up on this, um, different investors have different needs for the different properties they're buying. So, so many people get focused on this one thing because they hear it all the time. They go, what's the cap rate? And look, cap rate is like one piece, right? Um, my wife and I right now are in the midst of doing a 1031 and we're buying a couple of properties. To us, the most important thing is our cash on cash return. Like that is the number that matters to us. So we're trying to work the numbers to get that cash on cash as high as possible. Um, and then there's other people out there um, and we've all experienced these people. Um, as Tom said before, they're happy to have a negative cash flow because they just want to own that building and drive by it because it looks good to them. Like that being said, using the worksheet uh, like Tom has showed us today um, does a couple things. One is it makes sure that they understand what they're buying. Um, two, it makes sure they know that you know that they are being helped to understand what they're buying. So it's like it, it really just lays out all the pieces. Um, and then the other thing is it makes you as agents ask the right questions of the seller, of the seller's agent. And when you're doing your due diligence of the information you're looking to get, the expenses, the income, um, and understanding these four benefits. And, you know, there are, there are people on this call right now, um, including myself, who have gone into investment real estate. And all you look at is, um, as Tom mentioned, is whatever that rule is that, you know, that net income, gross income. And there are so many more benefits to this. Um, so without, uh, without, me talking anymore. I know I'm going to go to Emily Ford, who's got one, at least one question. If anybody else has any other questions to pop in here. Um, before we do that, I just want to remind everybody, Tom did mention, if you ever have questions, just give him a call. He picks up his, he picks up his phone. Um, he answers his emails within 24 hours. He's a great resource and he just wants to help us. Emily, why don't you chime in with your question? So Tom, um, when you're doing this worksheet, if you like, do you have some shorthand um, estimates for things like the, the expenses and the depreciation that you, you know, if you're just trying to work something on the spot really fast, is there well, some I way to there, narrow that, that down? Yeah, the, the uh, uh, when you're figuring your expenses, remember the operating expense ratio we talked about, the operating expenses divided by the gross operating income? I don't want to give you a number because the number in my town is going to be different than the number in your town. But by studying the market, for sure, you'll it'll jump out at you. If you, somebody shows you numbers that are way, the expenses are way low, you think, well, no, this isn't going to work. It, it, rough numbers, uh, just a ballpark number on a little apartment building, your operating expenses are going to be somewhere approaching 50%, 45 to 50%. If we don't know the numbers on a property, we routinely just cut the income in half. And you won't be that far. Now, the, the difference would be who pays the utilities. That'll change it. You know, if, if, you're, if you're paying utilities, the owner, that's one thing. If the tenants are paying utilities, which is a great advantage, in my opinion, uh, that'll be a different uh, operating expense ratio. As far as the depreciation, I, I, I just hesitate to do it because 
uh, so you might be buying a property that has a warehouse that has no personal property or very little personal property, but a great big parking lot with a lot of land improvements. You might be buying a furnished condo that has hardly any land and a ton of furniture, personal property. So uh, go to the website when we're done and click on the baseball bat. That'll give you those percentages uh, what, you know, on the worksheet. If you're having any trouble, call me. Like Lee said, you give me a call. I'm, I'm glad to help. Uh, uh, so that's a did that help or hurt? I, it probably it didn't help a bit, because yeah. because I wasn't I didn't answer your question because I'm not going to give you an answer for your town because I don't know. Yeah, no, but that's by, right. By studying it, though, Emily, you'll then you'll you'll know you'll know what's Lee and somebody like Lee who's been doing it for a long time. I would I would ask people who know ask property managers and managers well, what's the average operating expense ratio maybe here in in our town. Yeah, one of the okay. things that Tom touched on there is on the depreciation also. You're going to talk to your accountants about that, and they're going to talk to you about the best way to, to do those numbers. As Tom mentioned, you can uh, ideally, you can do them within the purchase agreement if you can. Uh, many times that doesn't happen. Um, there's yeah, you don't have to put in the purchase. I don't mean that at all. Yeah. Investor to investor, they'll, they'll negotiate land building, personal private and land improvements. If you're buying a rental house from somebody who lives there, that's just going to mess up the deal. You know, so, but you want to for sure, as we said earlier, find a good tax manager and don't do anything without running it by that person first, but good. Somebody who really deals with real estate. Lee, I bet you've got some names that you can help people yeah, with. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I'm going to give you, um, I'm not going to put the names out here now, but like one of the examples, I'm looking at a commercial building right now and my uh, tax manager has already told me he's pulling in a third party who is going to do the, get the depreciation numbers for us so that that's going to be applied for our accounting purposes. You know, it's a small cost, but it makes sure it gets handled correctly within our books. And it makes sure that I can take advantage of all those depreciation benefits without doing what, what most people do. And what most people do is here's the land, here's the property, and that's it. Um, what you'll and see, building. Here's the land, here's the building. Yep. building. Yeah. And what you'll see if you go through Tom's four part series, and he does a great job in the longer version of this, of pointing out how much you actually lose if you do it that way. If you do not account for, you know, land improvements and personal property, it's a big number. It's a really big number. What um, Lee's talking about there that you're getting probably is a cost segregation study. Is that what the, your, that's right. yeah, yeah. Cost, there are companies that do this for you. Uh, you know, prepare a report and so on. How much is land building, personal property and land building? Yeah, for sure. Um, Tom, I'm gonna see if there's any other any other questions. So if anybody wants to unmute themselves and jump in, that's awesome. I see, um, I don't have any other uh, questions out there. Um, I did during our, during your talk here, I posted links over to uh, your website. Um, I posted a picture where to go click on the website if you want these, uh, if you want copies of his worksheets. Uh, folks, Taking Tom's class is all of, it's a, it's a four part series that you can get from his website. It's all of 99 bucks. It's gonna be the best investment you make uh, into your business, uh, into your clients. Um, being able to share that worksheet, like all those pieces are really, really important. We're not talking about having to become a full on CCIM commercial broker here. It's about becoming an investor friendly agent. And that's where all of our conversations uh, have been over the last couple of months. Um, Tom, it looks like there's one other question before we go here. Nope, Lisa's saying th thanks. You are welcome, Lisa. Um, folks, we'll announce our, our next talk in the next couple of weeks. Until then, I'm going to go ahead and record this. Um, we'll put it up on our YouTube channel. Um, come on over and be a part of the Real Thinker uh, family, where we talk about uh, investment real estate all the time. Tom, do you have anything else that you want to share before we sign off here, my friend? No, I'm good. I got to tell Emily I'm going to go on my rowing machine now. She's inspired me. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you, Tom. Okay.